by 1851, Ireland had been under British rule for approximately 700 years. During that time, the native Irish population had uh, been driven off the lands and they were handed over to British and Scottish settlers who are known as landlords. They very often charged exorbitant rents and the penalty for non-payment of rents was eviction. An eviction in this context meant that the landlord's representative, who was known at that time as a landlord's agent, would arrive at the tenant's house. He would stand outside and he would read an eviction order and also the riot act. And he would be accompanied by a contingent of the local police and a demolition crew. And after the occupants were ordered out of the house, the demolition crew was set about uh, demolishing the house and they would raise it to the ground. The fear of eviction was like the sword of Damocles, always hanging over their heads, and they never knew when that sword would fall. Iron Moor had been owned by a titled landlord called the Marquis of Cunningham, and he sold it in 1850, he sold it to a man from Northern Ireland named John Charlie. Now, John Charlie was a businessman. He was a lawyer, although he was only 24 years of age. Uh, and uh, he came from a wealthy family who had made a fortune in linen manufacturing in Northern Ireland. He came from outside of Belfast. The previous landlord, Cunningham, didn't apparently have such a harsh history of treatment toward his subtenants. However, uh, when he sold it to Charlie, the island was now in the hands of a different man altogether, who perhaps was more um, distant emotionally, not having had any familiarity, relationship, history with the islanders, looked at it strictly as a profit and loss. He declared his intention of confiscating two-thirds of the island for his own exclusive use. In other words, he intended to fence it off and uh, stock it with his own sheep and livestock, his cattle. And in order to realize that objective, it was he felt that it was necessary to get rid of some of his tenants. So he decreed that all who were registered as subtenants on the island would have to go. And not only did he decide to evict them, he also decided to deport them. In order to understand what an appalling crime this was, we must remember that those people were abjectly poor, that they, were, that they had no knowledge of the English language, that they had known no other world outside of life within their own small, close-knit community, and that they were being kicked out into an alien world that they knew nothing at all about. There was a finality about the whole thing because it was virtually the same as if they died because they knew that they would never meet again in this world. All contact and all links with their, with their community here, with their own people, was severed on that day. They walked barefoot 40 miles across the mountains to Donegal town on a gravel road, which would have been a very painful experience, especially for the very old and the very young. <laughs> 
160 made it to Donegal Tall Town of the larger number. The schooner that the landlord had uh, arranged to pick them up was late. So they arrived in Donegal destitute, starving, fever stricken, uh, diseased, and uh, according to later reports by the Quakers, if it wasn't for the, the um, concern and the care of the residents of Donegal, many of those evictees would have died right there. And in fact, many did. The sailing ship on which the sail was called the Countess of Arran and she left Donegal town on the 24th of April 1851. She was not seaworthy and the Arranmoor people were well, very well aware of the fact that she was not because they had a background in seafaring and they knew that she was not seaworthy. Up to six weeks transit between Ireland and uh, the east coast of the U.S. They were crowded. They often lacked sufficient provisions. Um, they were infested with vermin and lice. They were cold. They were called coffin ships quite often and, and were indeed. Um, at least two family members from Aaron Moore that would have made it to Beaver Island died on transit. And uh, in those days, they simply put them in a canvas bag with a stone and threw them overboard. This is a, a pretty horrendous pass passage. It's uh, like going from the frying pan to the fire. And th there were more fires awaiting them on the East Coast and in Toronto and so forth. Eventually, they arrived in Quebec on the 5th of June, 1851. And the, the uh, Countess on, sank on her return journey with the loss of all on board. Well, they arrived into a situation um, where, in many cases, they encountered just as much, if not more, direct racism than the place they had left. They had left uh, a fairly remote island in a relatively remote region of Ireland. There was no red carpet rolled out for the thousands of poverty-stricken peasants that came off the ships in those days. Uh, they were despised by the ruling classes in America at that time. Uh, they, did, they did the most menial jobs. They were without skills compared to the other immigrants, like Scots and Welsh, where they were feared and despised because they were members of a religion that the larger body of American immigrants did not share. And um, in those days, the Irish were considered a sub-race. So they would find ads and signs and windows that said, no Irish need apply. Toronto was the center of a, a grain industry in those days. So they were developing railroads north, east, south, and west. You know, they're all over the lower Canada region. And they hired a lot of Irish immigrant labor to build those railroads which took those as Irish in all the directions the rails were going. There was one person who played a central role in, the, in getting the Iron War people to settle on Beaver Island, and his name was Charlie O'Donnell. He came from a small island that's sandwiched in between Iron War and the mainland here. It's called Rutland Island. Uh, he had been a ganger on the railways, and uh, he had a, a dispute with some of his fellow workers uh, with the result that he had to leave Toronto. He absconded apparently with a payroll and crossed the border into the United States. And he found a crew there that was working a lighthouse here at the harbor in 1856. Uh, got a job with them, made it up here, looked around, and immediately sent word back to Toronto. He told them about this land of milk and honey that he had discovered in Lake Michigan, where there was an abundance of fish, uh, there was timber for building houses, uh, there was uh, a farmland available there, so he persuaded the Iron Moor people to go and settle on Beaver Island. The Donegal Irish and the, the Iron Moor Irish specifically had a, a kind of limited view of what had happened to them in terms of the famine, okay? 
They didn't realize the extent of the famine or the extent of the neglect of the British government. Um, they only came to learn what had truly happened, the scope of it, when they hit the east coast of America. And it dawned on them that they had been um, betrayed and in, uh, in almost put to death by organized government. This fostered in them uh, a long-lasting mistrust of centralized authority. So when they heard of Beaver Island, the place where they could make their own government, literally, that was very appealing to them. <laughs>